Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you, see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, I want us to focus a little bit on the passage from Acts chapter 4, verse 23, which is in your leaflet. To believe in the risen Lord is to believe in the kingdom of God. It is to take seriously God's mission, a mission that has meaning in this world and the next. Jesus taught specifically about the kingdom of God in several different ways. There are three forms, if you will. If we were to open the scripture and make our way through them, we would see different ways in which Jesus speaks of this kingdom of God. Uh, I'm going to refer to the three ways that N.T. Wright puts it, an uh, Anglican theologian, but there are many others, uh, Episcopal scholars, who would say this. The first is that Jesus is about announcing the kingdom of God, proclaiming. The kingdom of God. The second is that uh, Jesus is about inviting others to be a part of the kingdom of God. Right? And the third has to do with the kingdom of God that lies ahead of us. The kingdom of God at the end of all time. Uh, and the eschaton. And eschatological. That's a big word for us all to learn today, right? But that in time kingdom of God that we all wait for. The scripture today is not speaking about the end time judgment kingdom of God thing. Whew, okay, so we can relax and, and realize we're not going to talk about judgment today. I want to talk about proclaiming the kingdom of God. I want to talk about inviting people to the kingdom of God. Today, uh, this is what is being revealed in this book, this passage from the book of Acts. Both the kingdom of God, an announcement, and the invitation. The mission of Christ takes shape in the world among God's people. And in our passage from the book of Acts, uh, Peter and John have just been released from captivity. And they, they don't really know what happens. They can't quite believe the power of God has released them. Uh, and they don't understand why the world is rejecting this proclamation of uh, the kingdom. Uh, why is it rejecting Christ's message? They see clearly that the powers of the world fear the gospel, the good news, this kingdom proclaimed uh, by Jesus, but they are yet to understand why. Where the Lord of Lords finds solidarity with the least, with children, with servants. It's easy for us today to see why. The powers that be might be worried about this proclamation of the kingdom for all people instead of just the powerful, right? But in that moment, they were struggling. Their gospel, it seems, the one that Peter and John are proclaiming is turning the world upside down. And they stay committed. They stay committed to a proclamation of the kingdom as well as an invitation. They proclaim that the power of this servant, this Christ, uh, brings a different view to the world. Peter and John pray and they receive the Spirit, we're told, uh, in Acts. And so they're able to hold fast to this different vision that Christ has proclaimed. We're told that they are filled with God's Holy Spirit as they seek to proclaim this kingdom truth that those who are lost, that those who are the least, that those who are the weak, and even that those who have died may be redeemed and raised up. They speak boldly and powerfully. So one of the roles that we might understand if we were to take this book of Acts passage, chapter 4, and apply it to our situation uh, is to understand that one of the roles of the church Today is to proclaim the kingdom of God and the power of the Holy Spirit for all people. It is to reveal to the world the good news of Christ's death for our sins and resurrection, which invites us then to partake 
and participate in the kingdom of God. It is our responsibility, in fact, to proclaim that kingdom to people. And then in the scripture, we're told that the gathered followers of Jesus shared in this passage what they had with each other. This is part of living into the kingdom. So we proclaim and then we live in it. This is part of the kingdom invitation today. You, you are invited, as others before you have been invited, to live a kingdom life in this moment, in our lives, in this generation. We see that this invitation to live for the kingdom is a commitment, actually. Christian communities before you have shared what they had so that all might have what is needed. This is the invitation that is before us. It is revealed in Scripture that the first Christians held things in common. Now, do you think they all got along? Probably not. I mean, they must have been human, right? So, it doesn't matter whether you got along. This is what I'm saying. They, they proclaimed that whether they got along or didn't get along, they shared what they had for the kingdom. Because it wasn't about whether I like you or don't like you, agree with you or don't agree with you. It was a kingdom action. It is revealed in Scripture that these first Christians held things in common. There was not a needy person among them. Think about that. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. Now, wait a minute. That makes us all nervous, doesn't it? Right? Like, let's be honest. We all love the Bible, but when it starts talking like this, it gets nervous. I get nervous about it. Somebody told me last night online, they said, well, just don't tell them that's what you want them to do. <laughs> You'll be fine. They laid it in the midst of the community, and it was distributed to each as had any need. The gospel proclamation is one that takes root in action by the community proclaiming the kingdom and inviting us to give so that all may, be, may benefit. It is a gospel that always finds energy and excitement when it supports mission and evangelism, you see. When we can take it off of what we think, what we like, what we want, and begin to focus it on the proclamation of the kingdom and the work of the kingdom to meet the needs of our neighbors, why, well, that has energy. I can get behind that no matter what I think of you, you see. The Church of Acts puts its energy into going and sharing and caring for others. A kingdom community finds life and deliverance in its Easter message in its proclamation because it believes resurrection has power in this world. For the church to truly undertake its vocation, it must produce a baptized people willing to do the work and share uh, in a way that looks like how Jesus did it. We must understand that as people of the church in this baptized community, we are first and foremost responsible for its mission to share the gospel of good news and to meet the needs of the community. Both evangelism and service, those kind of two faces of mission, uh, are faces of the actual kingdom. People will be attracted to that. A lot of times I hear people ask, well, how are we going to get people to church? Well, actually, the way you get people to church, you start doing kingdom work. You start healing, you start feeding, you start caring, you get beyond what divides you. People will be attracted. You proclaim a risen Lord, the forgiveness of sins. Stop judging yourself. That's when people get excited. Let me turn back to the practice of sharing just for a moment to ease your conscience a little bit. Jesus does not say, the scripture does not say that we only want the wealthy or we only want the poor. And nor are we told that everyone is to give everything. But we are invited to give what we have received. You might remember that passage. Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but I will share with you what I have been given. What I have been given. They shared the good news. That was one of the things they've been given. Grace, that was one of the things they'd been given. The Holy Spirit for healing, that was one of the things they had been given. Love, that's one of the things they had been given. They invited people into the community to share a response to that kingdom message. 
those who lived together in the community, uh, the 12 in Jerusalem, did share things in common, but we're told there are other models that some people shared what they brought. We know, uh, for instance, that Lydia and the centurion and Acts aren't told to sell everything, but they make their house open for the kingdom of God. They change their lives for the kingdom of God. And even there, in those places, those who had need, had needs met. This is important because it's under important to understand, I think, that it is our responsibility to share both the good news and the grace that I have received as a repentant but redeemed sinner from Jesus Christ. And to share from the dollars that I have in my pocket, the wealth of my house with my wife. I'll tell you a story about a young woman who came to a priest not long ago and said that she didn't have any money to get, but that she would tend the garden at the church. And that's her gift. I'll tell you of a man who fixes air conditioners and said he had no money to give, but that he would take care of the air conditioners at the church. We share what we have. We share what we can do. We share the gifts we've been given. We share who we are so that the kingdom may continue to be proclaimed. The care of the needy among the church was so important that the first ministers called into the flesh and spirit. We need people to care for the people in our neighborhood. The church is to aspire to a model of proclamation and a model of gift giving in all manners and times. And I promise you that if this is what you undertake in this place, people will be added to your number. And you will have enough to care in this church for the weak, for the needy, the vulnerable, for your neighborhood. And, and there will be enough left over if you live in the kingdom where our unity is based on Christ. You will have enough left over after you do that work for the electricity and to pay the priest and to pay the water bill. Remember, the sharing, the provision for the community only and always comes as a response to the proclamation of Christ's love and the good news. You will have what is needed in direct relationship to the faith that is present in this community as it was for the community in Jerusalem in Acts 4. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.